good evening. <laughs> good evening to everybody and welcome to our event this evening. I'm Sister Veronica Kagan, I'm a sister of the Holy Spirit, and it is my privilege to welcome you here this evening. Shrek Socially Responsible Investment Coalition was founded in 1982. It is a coalition inspired by faith and committed to action. The members view the management of their investments as a powerful catalyst for social change. We endeavor to create a more just and sustainable world through corporate responsibility. Tonight we have planned a wonderful educational program for all of you, our friends, our community members, and the many committed individuals who believe in our work. Shrink is able to do what it does because of the financial support we receive. Our gathering this evening was made possible by major donations received, and I want to acknowledge the many donors. If you look at the front of your program, they are listed there. We have some at the capitalist level, the defender level, and the advocate level. We can sponsor this event because of the many individuals, religious congregations, and organizations who have generously donated to us. Let us give a round of applause to all of the people. I want to say special thanks to Aubrey School of Theology for hosting our event this evening. Our program tonight is being filmed by Nowcast SA, and it will be posted on their website after the event. There are some envelopes on the table, and if you would like to donate to Nowcast SA, you can help them serve organizations like ours. We are privileged to have with us this evening Rabbi Samuel Stahl, who is Rabbi Emeritus of Temple Bethel. Rabbi Stahl is a co-founder of Interfaith San Antonio Alliance, whose mission is to bring together major faith leaders representing diverse religious traditions into a sacred working relationship by collaborating on various city projects that the leaders, through conversation and consensus, believe will serve the common good of the people of San Antonio. The vision of this alliance includes a commitment to harness the power of local religious leaders and their congregations across major faith groups for the purpose of reinvigorating civil dialogue and making San Antonio a more just and livable city. Rabbi Stahl will share more about this alliance and he will lead us in the invocation. Let us welcome Rabbi Stahl. Thank you so much, sister. I greatly appreciate that introduction. And I'm honored to represent the Interface San Antonio Alliance tonight at this important event. I greatly admire the work of the SRIC. Uh, we have the Alliance share with you many goals of working together to fashion a just and equitable society. I commend you on choosing the theme of housing justice tonight. I can't, uh, I can tell you why uh, in, uh, in a moment. But please let me first describe the nature of the Interfaith San Antonio Alliance. About two years ago, uh, Rabbi Stephen Guto uh, contacted me. Uh, Rabbi Guto is a native Texan. I call him a native Texan and a naturalized New Yorker. <laughs> he uh, was raised in Dallas, but has lived in New York for uh, several years. He's been a great advocate for social justice causes. He's held many national significant positions uh, in nonprofit Jewish and general organizations working toward justice. 
that he called me because he wanted me to help launch a program uh, called the Religious Leadership and Public Engagement Project, which was going to be organized by New York University. And he wanted me to do this in San Antonio. He planned to do this in several cities of, of a similar size and similar character. He asked me to bring faith leaders together to embrace a humanitarian project with two goals. The first goal, as the sister said, is to bring stronger bonds among the faith leaders of our community. Uh, over the past 20 or so years, I am disappointed to say that there's been a declining interest in interfaith work in our community. San Antonio has always celebrated its religious diversity and has optimal interreligious harmony. However, apathy has overtaken us in the last two or so decades. At one time, we had an active San Antonio community of churches. It no longer exists. An attempt was made to recreate it as the San Antonio community of congregations, and that attempt did not succeed. We also had at one time a downtown ministerial association. That no longer exists. Steve and I hope that uh, we can turn that situation around, and our beginnings, I must say, have been impressive. So that's the first goal, to bring the clergy leaders together, the faith leaders. The second is to benefit our city with a single humanitarian project. And our project that we chose after much debate is housing. For generations, San Antonio has suffered a severe housing crisis, as many of you know. This crisis has resulted in homelessness, lack of affordable housing, and the problems of gentrification. So many of our city live in poverty and squalor. And we know that many tenants living in what was once affordable housing can no longer afford their rents. They have to move to less desirable housing. Over 40 local faith leaders have met on several occasions during the past 18 months to discover ways to sensitize our congregations to this crisis. Some of the leading clergy of our city have been involved. And I'm going to mention here a few of the names I know to include is to exclude. So if your clergy person is not mentioned, uh, please uh, understand that I just had to make a selection because these are the better known names in the community. Uh, we have on board the uh, Reverend Patrick Gahan, who's the Senior Director of Christ Episcopal Church. Uh, Reverend Dr. Bob Fuller, the Senior Pastor of First Presbyterian Church. Reverend Beth Moulton, the Senior Rector of St. Mark's Episcopal Church. Uh, Reverend Dr. David Bignitsky of the Alba Heights Methodist Church. Rabbi Jeffrey Abraham of the Buddha Zion. And Rabbi David Komorowski of Temple High. Dr. G.P.C. of the Sikh community, uh, Omar Shakir and Mamet Oguz, who represent two of the Muslim communities in San Antonio. And we also have with us uh, Archbishop Gustavo and his Vicar General, Father Larry Christian. We're grateful that Mayor Nuremberg has been passionately committed to resolving our massive housing problems. Some who have addressed us at our main meetings have included Lourdes Castro Ramirez, who is the head of the Mayor's Task Force on Housing, former City Councilwoman Maria Berrios Otto, uh, who is obviously with us tonight, should be on the program, and uh, oh, there you are, or, yeah, great. Right. And uh, she's on the Mayor's Task Force as well. And uh, Ver Ver uh, Veronica Soto, who's the Director of Neighborhood and Housing Services. We hope that our 40 faith leaders will sensitize their congregations to the crisis if it is a moral issue. And we've asked them to do three things. One, to deliver four sermons from the pulpit on the housing issue. Number two, to organize a congregation-wide project, a hands-on project, to address the housing issue. And three, to confer frequently with city council and other city officials about this issue. 
We've been led by an impressive board, among whom our father Christian, the little gentleman, the junior, Jack Reese, and Judy Lackwitz, who's with us tonight. Uh, they've worked tirelessly for the success of this project. We also have engaged a very talented executive director, Reverend Wendy Holbrook, who's here. May I ask Wendy to rise to be recognized? denomination, and she is also the director of the American Academy of Preaching, right? Is that right, correct? Academy of Preaching. Academy of Preaching, yeah. Not American. Right. Is it international? Well, not yet. Not uh, yet, okay. I'm moving toward it. Okay. Uh, we're also grateful to uh, Reverend McVitsky of the Uncle West Methodist Church for providing office space to Wendy free of charge. We held an impressive press conference at San Fernando Cathedral last October, and Mary Nuremberg was one of the featured speakers at that. The prophet Jeremiah has enjoined us to seek the welfare of the city in which we are dwelling. And through the Interfaith San Antonio Alliance, we hope that we are fulfilling Jeremiah's mandate. And now with that in mind, I ask all of you to rise as able for the invocation. The prayer for the Holy Spirit and Oh God, we are so grateful that we have a home, that we have a place in which to eat, bathe, rest, and love. We cannot imagine the chaos of living without one. Home is where the heart is. If we have our home, we have our hearts. If we lose our home, we lose our hearts. Our home and our heart are bound together. For losing a home is like having one's heart ripped out, and whose heart has not healed faster by being in the right home. O oh God, we ache for our brothers and sisters made in your divine image who lack homes. They live on the street and eat out of garbage cans. For living this wretched life, we have blamed and mocked them and ridicule them. We do not know their names, but we call them homeless. We do not know what has impoverished them. In fact, we do not know them at all. We have only seen them sleeping in doorways, wandering aimlessly, staring out at us with hollow eyes. O oh God, fire us with zeal and passion to combat this blight of homelessness. Fill us with compassion, O oh God, so that we may use us, you may use us, to better the lives of those who suffer life's indignities without any shelter. Stir us, O oh God, to assure a home for them so that their hearts and bodies may find comfort and rest. And enable us to labor zealously so that no one will ever be known by the name homeless again. So may it be. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Scott. Greetings, everyone. It's so good to see all of you here. On May 15th, 1995, I walked into a little house on East Ashby Street, and I met a woman named Susan Mika, sister, Susan Mika. And on that day, Merced Housing, Texas had its first day at work. And on that day, I heard the words Socially Responsible Investment Corporation. She worked hard on it at that time. I would see people coming and going, didn't exactly know what was really going on. I heard about the different investments and sisters going to 
corporate meetings, and I was very amazed and impressed at the work you did. It's a full circle to be with you tonight. Uh, at the uh, end of February, I, I retired from Merced Housing, Texas, and I'm seeing that um, it allows me time to be involved in more things, and I love that. Basically, everyone in this room, um, I would think almost everyone in this room, had, has a basis for what you do that is grounded in faith. And that may have been uh, expressed in different ways in your family when you grew up. But somehow the idea of having a, a faith-informed, being able to be propelled forward because of what you believe to make a change and to have the courage to stand up for it is what I think this group is all about. Father Seamus Finn has been involved with you for a long time. And he's going to be our first speaker tonight. And um, we'll leave a story throughout uh, the evening. And my wish for you is that you learn what it is you need to learn and want to learn. And that when you go out the door tonight to head to your homes, you'll be inspired by some of these stories to do even more in the community than what you do now. And maybe some new ideas will, will take place tonight. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much, uh, Susan. And good to be back here again. Uh, nice to uh, come for my annual visit to San Antonio and certainly around the Shrek uh, gathering. Uh, I've got a very simple job, I think, tonight, sometimes is the case, and that is basically, I think, to set a context for a conversation about housing. Uh, one of the five rabbis' uh, comments earlier about the need for more interfaith collaboration on all of these issues. Uh, we just had a wonderful event at the Vatican on religions and the sustainable development goals. And there were 10 of the major world religions represented in the very same city hall that you saw uh, the Holy Father at and the bishops at their different meetings. So that's the first time I saw that level of collaboration. And I think the message of uh, the Catholic tradition is sure of uh, Pope Francis uh, and the number of Muslim countries that he has chosen to visit and given priority to uh, ought to be a, a word for all of us uh, to remind us that um, we do need indeed to continue the call that came to us from Vatican II about working collaboratively, collaboratively and cooperatively with other Christians, with other religions, because we are about constructing uh, God's kingdom. And uh, we we'll just want to reiterate that time. Uh, the other one I wanted to share was I saw a play a couple of weeks ago in Washington. It was a one-person play. It's called Silence. And it fits also with uh, the comments of the rabbi. Uh, it was written from uh, the main stage, the main actor is from the perspective of being a homeless person. So he spends the entire nine minutes talking to the audience, uh, telling the story, telling the story of his family. He actually engages in a few, uh, few different times with actual questions and answers about what, what's your reaction to this word? What's your reaction to when you hear somebody is depressed? What's your reaction when you hear somebody uh, is homeless? And very instructive very, very powerful medium uh, that picks up, I think, on what was said already uh, of the way that we do view uh, the homeless. And it's so much a, a part of all of our communities, not just here in San Antonio, uh, in the United States and elsewhere. So 
That being said, I want to take a quick little trip. I was asked to uh, say something about the rights to housing, and I want to do that uh, from two directions, really. Uh, I think the interesting thing about Catholic social teaching and much of that tradition is that it relies on, on, the, on the question of faith, uh, which was just raised, but also on reason. And so the schools that we come from are faith and the moral arguments and the legal and the reason arguments. And that's been very much a part of the tradition. Uh, don't need to, I think, go into talking about the many ways in which the scripture talks about sheltering the homeless. Uh, we're also very familiar with the many works of charity of the religious uh, <laughs> congregation founders that this work of charity, of feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless, was all very much a part of the inspiration of many of the congregations in this room. And the works of charity and almsgiving, uh, we, the scriptures are replete with reminding us of that being part of our response to Christ's call. On the reason side, I was interesting recently for any Dominicans who were in the room, I was in Geneva about a year ago, and they were honoring this obscure 15th century Dominican. Uh, uh, the, this was not a religious event at the United Nations, it was an event sponsored by the United Nations itself. Uh, in the, uh, and uh, this uh, considered to be the first great theorist of international law. And when you think about it, this gets into, you know, how we work together collaboratively across faiths and with those who have no faith. How do we enshrine in our legal system uh, what we consider to be the rights of each one of us, but then with the rights to also the obligations that we have to one another. And so that's always been very much a part of the church's tradition. The interdialogue between faith and reason. How are we motivated, informed, and guided by our faith? But how does that push us into the larger conversation in the secular community? And in the UN system, obviously, we're very familiar with those, those human rights that are elaborated uh, in the Declaration civil, political, social, cultural, and economic, as we begin to, uh, since 1948, to begin to elaborate and to pronounce different, uh, different understandings of those rights. Housing, shelter, as a human right is specifically articulated in the UN Declaration. And finally, we'll say a few words about what the Catholic tradition and teaching has said about housing. The UN Declaration says everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, and disability. So you think of this is the UN Declaration of Human Rights, probably a document that's been translated into more languages than any other document. Last time I looked, I think it said 350 languages this document has been translated into. An agreement amongst the bodies who are members of the United Nations system, where they elaborate clearly what their understanding of each of the rights that we have as human beings. The, for those of you who are uh, familiar with the writings of Pope John XXIII, we know that he picked this up very astutely in that encyclical Pachin and in 1963. Uh, the language is almost the same, right? We must speak of man's rights, of human rights, has the right to live, the right to bodily integrity, necessary for the proper development of life, particularly food, clothing, shelter, medical care, rest, and finally the necessary social services. So the language is pretty much the same in terms of what's identified. And we know that as this whole theory of rights has evolved and developed, that we now speak, for instance, of a right to food or a right to portable, portable water. And we speak of the many other rights that have been articulated within the system, 
as we deepen our understanding of who we are and the journey that we're on. From going forward from this, we look at the U.S. Catholic Bishops Conference, and this is a document that goes back to 1975, 85, and 86. So, don't need to go through each of these, but what they've consistently recognized is in 1975, the right to a decent home, a pastoral response. And that was reflected, I think, the value of a decent home and all the benefits that that brings was articulated again in the prayer of the invocation that we just heard this evening. So there is a consistent stream within the religious tradition uh, and a consistent stream within the legal and uh, tradition about the right to shelter and to a decent home and many other things that we see articulated, whether it's food, shelter, medical care, <coughs> education, uh, and particularly taking care of those who may not be able-bodied uh, in, in, in their living. Uh, again, reflected in 1987 by St. John Paul II, uh, again where he talks about finding concrete and urgent solutions to the housing problem and to see that the homeless receive the necessary attention and concern on the part of public authorities. So the interesting thing I wanted to bring out here is that this long extended discussion on the homeless and homelessness and there's lots of analysis out there and lots of data and research that tells us what has brought people to being homeless and living on the street or wherever else they live or taking refuge in shelters and don't mean to go in necessarily to that. But one of the things that we've wrestled with then is, well, whose responsibility is, is it to respond to that? And I think what you see in the UN Declaration and in the religious traditions, they're trying to balance the responsibility that they see from the public sector, which would be government, and the, the private sector, right, which would be faith, individuals, and the living out of their commitments. And I think that's part of what I see reflected in the outline of this evening's conversation. Uh, and how many of you have been involved in any kind of affordable housing schemes over the years? I'm sure many, many of you have touched it in different ways. And we know of the numerous different efforts that have been tried, right? In the public sector, there's many programs created by HUD or the federal government, but at the state government level as well, uh, whether it's sometimes in the form of uh, tax uh, uh, concessions that are offered. But then we've also had a blending of Merced housing that you just talked about, that individual communities, religious communities working with others, have put together loan funds, have put together various schemes by which they've helped first-time home buyers to secure a home. So we know that there are many of those kind of schemes out there uh, that have been tried, many of them very successfully. I think the question has always been, uh, what, at what scale and is it bigger? And is the response complete enough? Because we still seem to see an increasing wave of people who are homeless or being uh, on the back, on the end of just one mortgage payment out of losing their home or one, pay, one, uh, one salary uh, out of falling behind on their payments. So we've got lots of different ways and lots of different experience in this room and in most places about how that, those, that, those issues have been a part of the discussion. I think going forward, um, this is the question that strikes me is that it says at the, right at the beginning of this document from the Pontifical Council, churches, community groups, the private sector, <coughs> state and local governments must all do more to meet our common responsibilities for housing. So in some ways I think that articulates 
what your agenda is at the event this evening, is to say what are the roles, what are the responsibilities, what are the available responses coming from all those sectors. And I think certainly from my experience on the many issues that we are engaged in, in Washington or in the other projects that I work in, um, I think everybody is now understands very clearly that there is no single solution to any of the issues that we wrestle with. That it's multifaceted, that it's multi-stakeholder, that it's like a, as if you do have a pie and you say there are many different slices out of that pie, and that it's together the whole pie and the efforts of the whole community that can each make a contribution to that. So, we may theoretically want to fault the federal government. That's us in Washington. Uh, not me uh, personally, but that's the place that gets a lot of the heat for not being able to come up with a particular policy that responds to the needs uh, across the country. And I think we, would all, we can all know very easily that those needs are very diverse. From cities to rural communities to small towns, uh, to fading rust belt cities, to blossoming new communities. Uh, we, somebody already mentioned the whole gentrification challenges uh, face very much this, those realities in the city of Washington itself, as you know as well, if you've had a chance to, to visit our fair city in the last 10 years, the amount of building of condominiums uh, that are continuing to increase, many of them not occupied by owners, is a real problem. Uh, so, uh, going back simply to say that there is no quick solution to achieving the hot response to housing, but how we identify the different streams and the different threads is important. Uh, last one I wanted to point out to is that even though we've, we've spoken in the past a lot about the encyclical of Pope Francis, Love Out to Sea, uh, it, housing is not forgotten in the encyclical, even though it's very much focused on integral ecology. If you read number 152 in that encyclical, uh, a bit more expansive in the thinking, uh, clearly identifying and seeking to <coughs> sympathize with the challenges that people face who are without adequate housing and without shelter, but also I think challenging uh, in the questions of cities, that maybe it's time for us to be much more creative and much more innovative. Uh, and how do we incubate some of those responses? And I know if you do look at any of the uh, city magazines and uh, architectural magazines in particular, and some of the different examples from different countries, you do find people thinking about well, ways how do we actually house a population uh, in different ways than the traditional house on the street, mother, father, children, and pass on to the next generation? Is there a more efficient way of doing that? Is there a more energy effective way of doing that? Is there a more community building way of doing that? And are we willing to maybe tease some of that out? I think that's mentioned also, I think, in Laudato Si, that says, look, we are 7 billion people on the way to 10. Uh, the challenges that we face in terms of the resources that we need are huge. But we're not going to solve those by simply doing more of the same. We do need to come up with some new ideas, and I think that's true also of housing. Uh, we need to come up with some new uh, ways of imagining how we build community, how they contribute to community, and how that can be a part of the service and the work that we do together. Um, that's the end of my little context setting. I hope that does it. Uh, I was asked to say a quick update on some couple of the other projects we've talked about. Uh, good news, I think, um, for the investors in the room. Uh, there's been lots of people coming to the table out there who want to encourage and really uh, wonder about whether or not they've been responsive to the socially responsible investment mandate that they think we need. Leaders of significant asset managing funds, of significant corporations, simply saying, 
we cannot continue to ignore the environmental and social impact of the private sector in our world. And the markets in some way do need to respond to the challenges that we're facing. I think that's good news. We just need a lot more. I think secondly, um, the, uh, at the Vatican, we continue in a couple of projects that I've talked about here before, continue to work towards pushing forward some principles of socially responsible investing that might be helpful to the members of the Catholic community in particular who are not active in that space. Uh, what if you were to create an index fund was a proposal I saw in Rome recently that only contained companies that were consistent with Catholic social teaching. I think my immediate response was it would be a very small list of companies. <laughs> but nevertheless, you know, it was an idea that was offered across the table uh, because we do know in the Muslim community we have a great desire by practitioners of the Muslim faith that you would like Sharia compliant financial products uh, that helps them to manage their money, invest their assets in a way that's consistent with the teaching of the Quran. So on that front, don't expect any breathtaking news soon. Things move rather slowly when it comes to these uh, large institutions, but there are some good things happening, I think, on the front with the Vatican in trying to figure out ways to identify and to offer us some recommendations and some, some suggestions. But I think the other side is equally true, and you've already heard about this, is that many of the models that they're looking for, and many of the ideas that they're searching for, and many of the tools that are going to make this happen, they quite often come from the bottom up, not from the top down. Uh, I think recognizing that Shrek has been around since 1982 is a testament to your commitment and your doggedness in trying to find out answers to things that people sometimes said, well, you wouldn't understand that, so you better leave that to the professionals. I think the suggestion really needs to be that all of us need to wrestle with this question and try and identify and test some of, some of those ideas and bring them forward for conversation. So thank you much. Dr. Kristen Christine Glennon is, <clears throat> is a professor at Trinity University. She doesn't just sit there in her ivory tower. <laughs> she challenges her students and she mentors them. And it's not just theoretical because Christine gets involved in the community here. She specializes in understanding inner city neighborhoods. And you'll soon see that she can explain why San Antonio is the way it is. Why when you go across a particular railroad track on East Commerce Street, why do things change there? She um, has directed many of her students to Merced Housing Texas and to other nonprofit organizations as interns. We've benefited from that. We've even hired some of your ex students. And um, Christine also sits on the board of one of our peer nonprofit organizations, the Alamo Community Group. And so it's not just theoretical for her. And I hope you will enjoy what you're going to learn about the city we live in. Justice. 
So, historical geographical, right? That big order across time and uh, through time and across space is the way that I understood my title. And I took that quite literally because I want to try to ground the words that we've heard so far in our place. But we do have to do it historically because I, I feel deeply that if we're going to be effective in the work that we do, even if we, if we do it together or if we do it separately, and we have to know where we've been and how we got in the situation that we're in right now in order to be effective going forward. Because otherwise we'll continue to do the same and we won't make the impact that we hope to make. So this is going to be a, a, a historical, geographical, whirlwind tour. Um, and, and it is episodic, right? Like history is episodic. But we tend to understand a lot of these housing issues as in unique time periods, right? And I want to try to get away from that a little bit and put it into a, one narrative. Uh, and the reason for that is when we separate them out, we don't, we don't, we don't appreciate how we know related everything is, and we tend to specialize in one little bit of it, right? And then, and then not speak with others and learn from others. So this is my attempt to kind of build a continuous narrative, historically, but very, very grounded in this place. So my geography is here. So here we go. If, I hope. There we go. Phase one, episode one, the creation of our landscape. This is a story about neighborhoods. I'm going to tell you a story about neighborhoods and the development of the neighborhoods of San Antonio. Um, and, and again, I'm going to do that in these historic periods in 20 minutes. So we're watching. <laughs> um, my first phase, the creation of the landscape. The times, the times, the political times were those of separate but equal. And the, the years that I'm thinking about are about 1900. Uh, to about 1940, that was, let's see if I have a pointer, I do not, but that was, what, right there, that was the boundaries of the city, we know that, the six by six mile square, so that's where we're going to talk, I want to talk about that little place as, it, as, as we begin to develop it. So this is a very old map of the six by six mile original Spanish land grant, that was the city of San Antonio for a very long time, that we all, and we love that, we love it. Uh, and those red squares, right? Those red squares are our neighborhoods as they were developing. This is this comes from work that I've been doing over the years um, at Bear County Courthouse, looking up when the neighborhoods were developed and under what conditions. And I want to show you a couple of those. I want to show you a couple of those of those squares. There's one Beacon Hill. I love these old maps. I'm a geographer by training, um, and and these were all hand done. Now they're all digital and not so pretty. But, and sorry, it's, sorry, it's, it's, it's um, on its side. The north has to be at the top. <laughs> you agree with that, right? Um, but it is old maps, right? There's another one. North is at the top. Um, an old neighborhood, uh, not very far from here, actually, just a little south. Um, come on. There we go. Where are we? Um, map right in this area right here, close to downtown. And there's the housing, right? That, that, that tremendous Texas housing that we love, that it, this is the kind that's appreciating value tremendously right now. And there's the, the original deed to that house, right? So when that house was built, when any house is built, it has a deed. And in the deed, it tells where it is, where it, right? Where, um, legal language about where this thing is and where all its files exist in the courthouse. And then these are, these are some, of the, some of the instructions, right? Like the legal instructions on what can be done in that house. So they include things like, you can't treat people with contagious diseases in this house. And that was an issue in the 1920s when that deed was written. Is that your TV and color over real issues? You can't sell wine or beer out of this house. You can't live in your car in the back of this house or any kind of temporary structure. And then, and then additionally, this, this house could never, never expressly understood and agreed that any sale or lease of this said premise, or any part to, or any parties thereof, to any Mexican or person of Negro blood, shall immediately cause the title to revert to the grantor. So not only can you not sell a wine, or treat somebody with TV, or or, or power, or live in your car, you also can't sell this house to any Mexican American or African American, or it will immediately be taken away. 
away from me. Um, if I if I just go around the city, like some of these additional neighborhoods, that was for here. But if I just took a took continued on my tour to the south side, I would find the same. Right? It's the very same. It's almost like it's almost like they, they used the same document in order to in order to build all of our all of our neighborhoods. If I go to the west side, right, Prospect Hill, one of our beautiful neighborhoods on the west side, same. The same language is in these deeds. Um, which causes me to think about if all of these neighborhoods that were being built up in the really between the 1920s and the 1940s, 1900s and the 1940s, were all deep restricted, right? For, and which, which allowed the Anglo population to go into these new developments, these new beautiful neighborhoods, but it restricted those for non-whites, right? So that entire population was really was really funneled into the inner city, which causes us Think about this area. If this, if this is restricted for whites, where's everybody else? Because this has always been a city of non-whites. So well, where does everyone live? And we and, I, and so, so if we continue the digging, right? And we start to look at some of these inner city neighborhoods uh, that, 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 that are really are within our, our inner city. And here we are today.
we need you to we need you to start to, to start writing mortgages again. We need you to lend money in order to pull us out of this depression. And the bank said, no, it's too risky. And the federal government said, well, what if we do this? What if we go into every city in the country and we look and we and we evaluate the housing, right? And we evaluate the demographics, and then we'll tell you banks where it's where it's safe to invest and where it's not. And that's exactly what they did. So they come into they, there's our old city, right? And they come into San Antonio, and they and 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 they 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 look at the housing, right? Federal government looks at the housing, and they and they also when they did this, they said if an area had had a really decent housing stock, right? A very good housing stock that was built well and housed a homogeneously white population, we'll call it green, right? And then, and then they also said, if an area has a, a, a decent housing stock that was built well originally, then it has a little bit of room for maybe some infill, some vacant lots, but it's still homogeneously Anglo or white, we'll coat that blue. And that's the signal to the bank, fine, you can lend money there. Buy and sell homes, you can get a mortgage, and, and, and if we, we'll consider that, or we'll, we'll, tell, we'll consider that to be risk-free. And these are some of our neighborhoods in our inner city that were coated green or blue in the 1930s and the 1940s. Right? Some of the housing is still there, right? And it's retained, it, 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 it's actually really come back in value. There's also some infill housing. In other areas that these, that these folks went into, they said, well, if the housing stock is starting to deteriorate, and it's still, it's still fairly homogeneously Anglo or white, but there's a non-white presence in the area, and it kind of that threatens the homogeneity, then you code it yellow. And that's a signal to the banks that this area was a little bit riskier. Right? And this is the housing stock today there. And then finally, if an area, the housing had deteriorated, and there was a non-white presence in that neighborhood, you code it red. And this is the federal government telling, telling the banks, we've coded it red, which means that it's a high risk, it's a high risk area for investment. And we probably don't recommend lending in those areas. And these are, we call it redlining. And these are our, the city of San Antonio's redlined areas. Right? And we know that this is the housing stock that, that, that's in these areas. And this, again, no time travel. This is today. Right? So what we've got is we've got layers now. We have deep restricted areas and non deep restricted areas. And it's those non deep restricted areas that now got coated yellow or red. So there was no money, there's no investment money that's going to flow into those areas for a very long time, for a, for a huge section of the 20th century. President Johnson finally says, no more of that, no more of that nonsense. We're not going to do this anymore. But by now, we've got a landscape that's been in place for a long time. And it's also started to sort our population between Anglo, you can live here, and your houses are going to look like this, and non-white, non-Anglo, you can live over here, in a very different kind of geography, in a different kind of neighborhood and neighborhood setting. And your houses are going to be worth this. And we know that this is our wealth. This is our inherited wealth. Now we build our families and we invest in our families. Episode or period three, 1960s to the 1980s, what I call the institutionalization of that landscape, when it finally really gets locked in, right? But this is also the area that we, that we pride ourselves on. This is the area of equal rights, right? And civil rights, and and and, and really, like from the top, again, from the federal government down, we all got on this bandwagon and said, yes, no more of this. Now we're going to treat everybody the same. Everyone has dignity, and we did this, right? So again, our city starts to grow and continues to grow through the 1970s, 1980s through today. Uh, but equal rights. What do I mean by that? In this setting, what I mean is in our educational. System, right? Brown versus Board, and then all of these different, more Texas, er Texas era or Texas specific um, laws and, and, and regulations, including Robin Hood Act, takes past, tax, and start, and treat every child the same. Give them all the same tasks, right? Give them all the same curriculum. In public, in public investment, is rough, what we call rough proportionality. Every, every, every city council district gets the same amount of money. And in our representative democracy as well, we have 10 equally populated city council districts. So our school districts, right? Our school districts form at that time. And Robin has put in place, every child should theoretically have the same amount of money. Right? Our city council, 
finally in the 1970s, he has single member districts. And each of those is apportioned the same amount of money. Right? What's and what is what's the result of all of that inequality? Of all of that inequality is really it's really uh, just the status quo. Mm -hmm. Right? It really it really kind of cemented the status quo in, in place. So what we had was in these areas that it, that had already been redlined, those those neighborhoods or those houses are not appreciating value. Right? In areas that have been yellow lined. They're not appreciating as much value also. But these areas that have been in green or blue, right, as far as, as, far as mortgage money coming or flowing into those areas, the housing in those areas is appreciating today and even, even what we would call gentrification, right? Because those areas have always had the best in dollars. These others, the, the values of those properties is actually falling. So today, really, really where we are today is in what I would call phase four, this financialization of housing. And, and your speaker before me had said this, we're in an era now where we don't, where housing is an investment. It's not even a shelter anymore, it's an investment. And that's exactly where we are today. We really, we accumulate wealth now through investment and housing is the number one. We used to make things in our economy. We made cars, we made washing machines, we made tables. Now we invest in housing as the number one way of making money in our economy. And we see that, right? We can see that. So as, as our city has continued to grow, I'm going to focus down here again in the inner city because that's where a lot of our problems are really, are really materializing. So our inner city now has once again been, been identified, identified as value. We let it deteriorate. But now we've turned around, and the we is interesting. The we is the banks, the we is investors, the we is insurance companies, and we've identified it as valuable again. Right? So what does that look like? So, so we're back here again, and it looks like this. It looks like older fourplexes that were affordable. Right? They're, they're afford this was our, some of our affordable housing. Again, fourplexes have been torn down. And, and, and replaced by some leads, right? Quarter million up to half a million dollars homes. And actually, these are not owner occupied. These are investment properties for somebody. So we, we remove affordable housing. Our, we, we, um, as a city, we allowed this to happen in the last couple of years, and it's happened repeatedly. And we're building, now we're allowing to be built is this, this kind of investment property. We're investing in, our, in, our, in, our, in, in a lot of public spaces, right? Some are being privatized, but we're also investing in public spaces, which, was, which is a celebration. But we're not, we haven't realized that that also has an impact. It has a tremendous impact on the people that live around it. So we've invested in some Pedro, some Pedro Creek, and it's, and it's lovely. It's beautiful. And we all appreciate it, right? Come on. So, but, but people live along it. And now the value of that property has gone up. And a lot of people have been displaced. And we have people here in the room that have worked really, really hard on these, on some of these issues of displacement. Uh, and so the older, older apartments like these that were affordable, that house a lot of our inner city labor force have now been purchased as investment properties. And the rents have gone up and a lot of people have been displaced. So the story. Right? The story that I tell is, is a very local one, right? a very local one so that it was the intent of trying to understand where do we fit? Where, where do we fit with the intent of where do we enter? Right? Where do we, as people who are really concerned with these issues, how do we enter into this longer history so that what we do is effective and strategic? Right? We don't want to try the same old stuff again. And, if, and I really, really deeply believe that if we know the history of what's been done and how we ended up here, then maybe we can be strategic with our own resources and our own time and work together in order to try to in order to try to to, to try to figure this one out. And, and Merced Housing and the Alamo community or the, the word that I said, this is this this is one piece of the future. Um, it's looking forward and thinking about affordable housing and, and with really with an alternative vision to some of these some of this action that we're building up there. So thank you and I turn it back to you. I can't imagine falling asleep.
sleep in one of these students' classes. <laughs> Our next speaker, Maria Arizama, um, is responsible for Merced Housing Texas' very existence. Um, I think Sister Jane Ann may, may tell the story more fully, but basically, Maria, from what she observed in the community, it goes back to what I said in the very beginning, that you're motivated by your faith and your surroundings to feel like you need to make a difference. And she was very bold to challenge the sisters to look at what the needs were in this community and work together between and among the congregations to address the, those needs together, to create a corporation together. And those religious congregations capitalized the organization in the beginning, and we wouldn't exist without Maria. And just in a few days, she's Dr. Maria Dariusawa. that you had. 
uh, and then to Christine uh, to thank her for reminding us again the history of why we are where we are. Por qué estamos como estamos. Uh, and there's a reason. And I was asked to talk about gentrification and displacement, but the Lord is always with us, and Christine just did what I was going to do. Very briefly uh, talk about what gentrification is, essentially changing neighborhoods. Um, and the people who were there before who tend to be poor and of color leave, and then other people come, come in and bring wealth. And then this, the displacement that's occurring in San Antonio right now is due to our success. We're investing, we're building new things. So the property values are going up and taxes are going up, and people can't keep their properties. Uh, we're building um, beautiful uh, structures in the middle of neighborhoods, and that brings up the property value, so the taxes go up. People lose their homes. And then we're doing things like the Southern Mission Trails, uh, where somebody buys a um, mobile home park and 300 people are displaced. And we have no city, pol no city policy uh, to take care of it. So in, uh, right after Mayor Nuremberg got elected uh, a couple of years ago, he did what he had promised to do, and that is to address the issue of housing. So he named a housing task force, the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force. We worked for a whole year, and we came up with uh, some recommendations. We also want to find, we got some, um, yeah. we um, gathered some data and came up with uh, a list of what the problems are based on data. And I'm not going to go through them. I don't have enough time because I told the story. Uh, but you can read what it is, and then I'm going to tell you how you can get a hold of that report. So, um, it, you know, we know this intuitively. You know that people can't buy houses because they're too expensive. Rents are going up. People are paying more than 30% of their income in housing, and that's not what the, that's not how it should be. People are losing their homes. People are being displaced. There's a problem. Uh, and then we came up with some recommendations, only five. It's a framework. We did not say one, two, three, four, five, this is what you have to do. We had five very broad areas that we wanted the city council to look at and, and implement them. Uh, get the city to work together, get all the departments to work together. They don't right now. Uh, increase the city's investment in housing and not depend so much on the federal government because that money is dwindling. We're not going to get as much money from the federal government that we have been getting in the past. So the city needs to spend more of our local money in housing. We have to increase uh, production of affordable housing, which means uh, for us, the need exists in housing of people, of households 60% AMI and less. That's forty. Uh, that's thirty thousand uh, dollars, because that's where the greatest need is uh, in preservation, maintaining the housing that we have that's still good. We have affordable housing that's existing right now. We need to keep it, uh, and then to invest in rehabilitation, fix up what needs fixing, protect and promote neighborhoods. Number one, try to see something, to do something about the taxes that keep increasing. Number two, deal with the issue of displacement. Uh, and number three, reach into the community. Do outreach, you know, spend money. People going into, into the neighborhoods and explaining what is available for them and to identify what the needs are. And then the last one is to ensure accountability to the public, to make sure that we have an open and transparent system so that our community knows what we're doing and help us, because that we need the, the participation of the community. And one of our recommendations was to redefine uh, what used to be the old housing commission, and the city council did it. We now have a housing commission that is, that is responsible for oversight of the implementation of the mayor's housing policy task force. That had never been done before. We have a Lourdes Castro Ramirez in the chair, of that committee. She was the chair of our task force. And we have one of the members here, Jessica Guerrero. We have nine members that are charged with doing that. And then at the end of the year, they're going to come up with a um, with a report of how how we did. Now, what I would like to, um, to share with you, uh, and after 
you know, hearing um, Christine talk about and show pictures of the neighborhood, to me, it's, it's organic, it's visceral, because I lived in a neighborhood where, until I was 13, the water would come to my knees. And we thought it was great. You know, it was raining, we're going to go back there and get wet. Uh, but it was horrible to live in a house that you couldn't invest in because the rain would go into the house. And so to me, the issue of housing is just like inside, it's in my stomach. And um, we, um, one of the things that I did when I got on the task force was to go back to 1990 and I reviewed 11 different plans, reports that had been done on housing. And what I found is that many of the recommendations are never implemented. So somebody picks and chooses what is implemented. And then I notice that the things that are implemented are the things that are going to make money for somebody. If it's something dealing with uh, homeless or with poor people or something that's going to cost you, uh, those things don't get done. So another task force, another commission comes up, they make the same recommendation over and over. So one of the things we did was create that commission. Hopefully, uh, that will be done. But what I want to tell you that at this, at this point, I'm waiting, I'm waiting uh, for some of our very first and important recommendations to be done. They have not been done. And this report was adopted in September of last year. One of the things we want the city to do, and we're still waiting, is to hire, create a position of a top-level housing person that knows what they're doing in housing. Because what's going to happen to us, and we've already been told, we have a crisis in this city. And we don't know it. We, I don't think we know how bad it is. We, how many people know that San Antonio College offers students a parking lot for them to sleep at night? There are colleges that are offering their, their um, parking lots for them to sleep. That there have been what's called sweeps in districts 3, 6, 8, and 10. Because there are encampments. People just create these encampments. So what does the city do? The city goes and does a sweep, which means take the people out of there. And we don't know where they go. Uh, there's the, the dis displacement that's going on. I suggest that one of these days you go down Grayson Street in Broadway, that neighborhood is totally disappearing. Or take a ride down Proband and Flores and see what's happening to the St. Philip of Jesus, St. Henry's neighborhood. It's almost gone. Uh, uh, houses in neighborhood, I, I think of um, neighborhoods in churches. Uh, Christ the King, St. Agnes. Uh, Sacred Heart. Uh, just look at some of those houses. They're little houses. They're not going to be there because right now people are buying entire blocks. Because I think those are the next um, Kmart and Walmart uh, for the people who live downtown. And uh, so, so we have a crisis. So what I wanted to ask you, what I want, because it, this is a wonderful group of people who are doing so much at every level here locally, statewide, nationally, and internationally. You have connections all over the world. And, and every single one of you is people that do a lot already. And I want to, to I make a list of the people who I thought would be here today. Um, institutions like the Archdiocese of San Antonio, like the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, uh, the Cops Metro, I think there were some representatives here. The San Antonio Religious Leadership and Civic Engagement Project that's um, multi-faith. The several congregations of sisters here. People from Accept Housing. Uh, I, I have, my husband and I have a table of people with the San Antonio Housing Oversight uh, Coalition. One of my biggest hopes because they're young people. Um, and but what would happen if we all made it a priority? Like, I don't know what can be done, but there's got to be a lobby for housing. There is no lobby for housing. So this beautiful report that I'm so proud of can be just one more that sits there, and there's Maria totally frustrated, and I've been doing this for decades, for decades. Uh, 
And, and I get frustrated, and I apologize for getting like this, but, but something has to be done, and I don't know what it will take. There is uh, the group, like I said, housing. The city needs to have more respect and more attention given to our nonprofits because they are not. The city competes with them instead of helping them thrive. And we need to change that. You know, how do we do it? I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. I just know that there have to be a lot more people with clout, with resources, and particularly with the, with the things that we have been charged with. And this is how you get the report. But I was reading this that I was very moved by back in 1988 when I read it the first time. And I'm going to close with those words. I'm eating up my time. I'm sorry, but I have to read this one. And it says, it's, it's about all the things the church does, good things, and then the bishop say. Yet, we cannot pretend that soup kitchens and shelters represent a truly humane and effective response to poverty and homelessness. Charitable efforts cannot substitute for public policies that offer real opportunities and dignity for the poor. Shelters cannot substitute for real housing for low-income families and poor individuals. We owe our sisters and brothers more than a cot and a blanket for the night. We owe them a chance for a better life an opportunity to live a life of dignity and decent housing. And this is, is, is a tremendous charge for us. And I'll close with this, that I consider when we are saying that we represent the vulnerable or that we want to help the poor, the level of responsibility that's on us to deliver is great because they cannot defend themselves. So thank you.
and I met with Maria, and she said, you sisters have been in this community for over a hundred years. You have universities, hospitals, schools, social institutions. You have power, and you don't use it. She was right. So we, uh, she said, you need to get involved and make some changes. And so we, we did, as Susan said, we, we investigated and talked to Maria, talked to city uh, council members and, and uh, had accountability sessions of our own and, and came up with the, with the conclusion that affordable housing with enriched service uh, support would be uh, the focus. And uh, Merced came into being uh, 24 years ago, almost 25, and I was on the, uh, asked to be on the board, uh, I was not in leadership anymore, and asked to be on the board from the beginning. And uh, there were six congregations that, that put up some uh, funds or loans and, to get this started. And as we, as we went through the process, uh, Mercy Housing was, in, it was a good investment at the beginning, or a good collaboration because they had the infrastructure. They had the legal uh, means and the financial means and the and bookkeeping means and so on to, to make get this off and running. What they didn't understand was Texas politics. They were in Denver and we were here. And um, they, needed, uh, they needed to have the thing move along as, as they had, uh, had been directing them in other areas. They had a, a funding source, they had, they had a rehab source, and everything was multifamily. Susan, who was the first president of Merced, was an, is a, Susan is a networker. She is a relational person. She develops relationships, trust relationships. And so as the, we were in this about four years, and the pipeline that Mercy Housing talked about wasn't being developed. We had one little um, property in Somerset, which was very small, and um, it just, it, they were not happy. Uh, the, the folks in Denver were not happy with what Merced was doing. And they wanted, I happened to be at the time the chair of the board, Sister Carol Ann Jokers, had begun uh, as the first chair. And uh, she was moving to Corpus, and I think uh, I, I was here in San Antonio. So we had, I had to talk to the, well, actually, I want to bring in Rufus Whitley, Father Rufus Whitley, came to one of our meetings, and he said, you know what you need to do is incorporate separately from Mercy Housing. Now, I'm a sister of Divine Providence. The name of our organization was Merced. It wasn't Mercy. So, when we looked at separating, it was an easier separation because we had a name that was that was different from Mercy Housing. But we used their, their structure, their means, we used what they had begun with, and it served us well, it served us quite well. But we did separately incorporate, uh, and in, in preparing to do that, I had to call the superiors of all the congregations. We had no money. We had no money, but what I kept saying was, I wanted, we wanted permission to separately incorporate. And I said, we're poised. Susan has done the groundwork, the development of the relationships. We're poised to move forward. We have trust in the community, and we're ready. And they, God bless all of them, said, OK, go for it. So we did separately incorporate as Merced Housing in Texas. Father Rivers helped us. Um, we had the, the, the assistance of, of some other attorneys, and Merced, what we have to do in Merced Housing is came into being. And we were able to get funding of, through all kinds of sources because um, we, we, had, uh, we collaborated. Susan had set us up to collaborate with so many organizations. And the rest is history. So currently, that's, that's in a nutshell, the history. And today we have 1,715 apartment units. 
around in Texas, in South Texas, and in around the state, other places. We have, we have uh, repaired over 630 homes, homes that, that are owner-occupied that have severe uh, challenges, uh, either the hot water tanks falling through the floor or the bathroom doesn't, it barely holds up people up, the roof is leaking, or the hole in the porch, whatever it is. These homes have not been brought up to code, but, they, but the fatal flaw has been repaired so that the people can continue living there in safety and quality of life. We have, we have uh, renovated over, with 20, uh, we have renovated 22 homes that were either abandoned or in a neighborhood that were uh, crack houses or dope houses that were bringing the neighborhood down. Those homes have been, have been re totally rebuilt and Merced has assisted the uh, persons to purchase those homes, which has not only helped the per people who purchased the home, but the people in the neighborhood have fixed up their homes as well. So the neighborhoods have been improved by this. We have provided resident services uh, support for 2,670 families in our resident services program in the multifamily housing um, units. Uh, the six original congregations that that are the founding congregations are the Sisters of Charity, the Incarnate Word, uh, the Sisters of Divine Providence, the Missionary Catechists of Divine Providence, the uh, Sisters of the Order of St. Benedict, the Daughters of Charity, and the uh, Sisters of the Holy Spirit. And um, we are we have, we agreed at that time that there would be uh, the availability of of people to sisters to serve on the board and to make, make sure that the uh, that the spirit and founding uh, mission of Merced was, was certainly maintained. And I think we have, uh, we're celebrating, we're going to celebrate 25 years soon. We have so much gratitude for Susan for uh, being the leader that she is and she, uh, not only did she lead us well, but she made sure that the transition from her leading Merced would be passed over to, to Kristen uh, Navila, who is, it's, it's been a seamless transition. So Merced is alive and well, and we're so happy that you're here, and that we're so happy to tell you about it. So thank you.
And then when I went in the kitchen, I realized that she had boxes on her stove, so her stove wasn't being used to cook. So that was house number one. And um, at that time, I thought, well, who can we get to help us? And I asked a friend who was a manager of, of one of our multifamily uh, properties, and she said, I'll send my man over. So we replaced her water heater, and we helped her with some electrical repairs. And, and that was house number one, and yes, we fixed her porch. And um, Robert Como is here tonight to tell you about another house. Never has so much time and so much money gathering happened for one house. But this isn't just the story of a house. It's a story of everything we've been talking about. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Four years ago, on a Friday evening, I received a phone call from a 101-year-old Mary Lou Miller. Now, some of you may have met Mary Lou because when she was in her mid-90s, she got involved with the Social Responsible Investment Coalition and came to a number of functions. <laughs> Mary Lou said, Bob, I need you to meet with Miguel. He's got a problem, and I need you to fix it. <laughs> I said, hello, Mary Lou. How are you? <laughs> Who is Miguel? Miguel Calzada had performed many kindnesses for Mary Lou, transporting her, fixing things in her apartment, running errands. We later learned that he had done the same thing for many neighbors, asking nothing in return. He is a good man, a simple man, a loving man, but he was dealt a bad hand. I'm a political junkie, and when Mary Lou called, it was just a few weeks before the 2014 election. So I told her, I said, give me a call back after the election. I'll be glad to help. She said, no, you will meet with him at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> if you know Mary Lou, you know, that's what she said. At 10 o'clock the next morning, I met her. I met an amazing man with an amazing story. His beloved wife, Guadalupe, has been hospitalized. And while Miguel was with her, they had a house sitter. The house sitter was approached by a man who said he wanted to buy the house, a century-old Queen Anne home that Miguel and Guadalupe had lived in for 50 years. Mm. When told that the house wasn't for sale, the man said, don't you know that I can call the city and have them come bulldoze your house and send you the bill? That afternoon, the man was seen taking pictures over the back fence, and that was the beginning of Miguel's problems. Five days prior to my meeting with Miguel, the city of San Antonio had sent him a letter stating that they would bulldoze his home within 30 days. Miguel, with a fourth grade education, working since he was eight, and the sole support of his family since he was 14, was spending every penny taking care of Guadalupe, who was praying for a liver and kidney transplant that she never received. Mm. Miguel himself had had a widow make a heart attack 12 years earlier. Every one of their spare pennies went for medical expenses. If you see this picture up there, after a rain, this image appeared on a piece of drywall, the rain having come to the, the leaky roof. And Miguel had a great devotion to our lady of Guadalupe. His wife was Guadalupe. But Miguel lost Guadalupe about a year into our work. And Mary Lou ended up dying at the age of 102. Mm. And sadly, earlier this year, Miguel lost his only daughter. Council member Diego Bernal advised us how to slow down the process of them bulldozing the house. And pro bono attorney Michael White filed a motion which was to be heard on December the 15th. If we lost, the bulldozers would come and demolish the home. So we had to act fast to secure his private possessions. Architect David Bogle arranged for a pro bono structural engineer, Patrick Sparks, to inspect 
and they determine the home could and should be saved. In the meantime, Diego resigned to run for state representative. I followed with 12 others seeking the appointment to city council. On December 10th, instead of using my three minutes to explore my many virtues, uh, what I did was I talked to the city about how they should be saving, helping the McGills of the world and not trying to bulldoze their home. I invited them to a work party to pack up the household belongings and secure them in case the bulldozers came. The next day, the council chose Roberto Trevino. And the following day, I burned off uh, Councilman Trevino until finally about 8, about 10 o'clock at night on Friday night, he returned my call. I convinced him to join us the next morning for our work party that began at 10 o'clock. The new councilman asked if, I, if he could come at 8.30 to personally inspect the house, since as an architect, he could see for himself if the home could be saved. On that Saturday, December 13th, his second day in office, a council member Trevino inspected the house, saw that it was filled with items, but he thoroughly inspected it, acknowledging that it could be saved, but it needed a lot of work. And that was an understatement. It really needed a lot of work. When we walked out the front door, he and I were both surprised to see over 50 neighbors who had come to help us secure their house and to help the, the Calzadas. In moving to the storage facility, one box fell off the trailer, a box full of their best dishes. But it was so well packed by volunteer neighbors that nothing broke. <laughs> this show of support from neighbors, I believe, convinced the judge on Monday to give Miguel's home the state of execution. With grants from Merced Housing Texas and the San Antonio Conservation Society, with help from the Neil Greedy Family Foundation, USAA Foundation, Kronkowski Charitable Foundation, the amazing Haven for Hope volunteers, ambassadors, uh, help from San Antonio Alternative Housing Corporation, and successful fundraisers, we were able to satisfy the city of San Antonio, which has then released us from the demolition order. We have a steering committee of three, Pastor Tom Heeger, a Presbyterian mentor, myself, and my heroine and a friend of 37 years, Maria Maria Lyon, who lived around the corner from Miguel. In a meeting which Tom and I had with Merced House in Texas in the fall of 2015, Merced offered to do an end of the year fundraiser for Miguel's home. But they suggested that they should take over the supervision of the renovations from us amateurs, believing that patrons would not donate to a project being done. By amateurs. They wanted to ensure quality and permanence. It was at that moment that I knew that there was a God and that Merced Housing were acting as his agents. So thank you very much, Susan, for your participation since that time. And by the way, it may not be my place to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, understand that today the city of city officials in San Antonio will recognize you and establish a Susan Sheeran Bridge Builder Award. Is that correct? So congratulations. <laughs> Merced has since hosted another end of the year fundraiser. Kathy Lawton hosted one, and we've had several home fundraisers. All together, we've raised over $100,000 and received plenty of pro bono assistance to save and get something. Upon completion of one interior wall, and I think the contract has been done on that, then we have union electricians and union plumbers, volunteers, who will rewire and replumb the house. Uh, Bob Furbo has offered hundreds of dollars worth of electrical supply. Union sheet metal workers will be doing the finials that will race the roof. And union communication workers will wire for, for phone and internet, all being done by volunteer labor. CPS will totally weatherize the home. And let me repeat my phrase for Haven for Hope ambassadors who have done the scraping, the sanding, the painting, and will take and float the drywall. As one participant said, we are rebuilding this house as we rebuild our lives. They are terrific workers and inspiring to work with. They are women and men who are in rehab uh, for a growing alcohol addiction, and they're just phenomenal individuals. 
We have some six, more, six months more work with many voluntary and professional services. We've been very prudent with our resources, but we still need the help from the shed house in Texas raised about $60,000 or more for fixtures, appliances, maybe even air conditioning. I sincerely believe that Miguel and Roll will be story, plus the neighborhood of community involvement, help call attention to the gentrification that is running people out of their homes. I hope that never again happens in San Antonio. I believe in what Maria wrote. The responsibility belongs to all of us. We need to see housing as a human right and a matter of justice. We help people with their housing needs because it is the right thing to do. Wouldn't it have been wonderful to get a no interest loan to the Calzadas where they could have corrected problems when they started before they got out of hand? It could have enhanced the quality of their life, probably extended their lives. The loan could be repaid so the flood is replaced when they no longer need the home. Thanks to Councilman Trevino, this building standards board has been reconstituted and compassion is now a component. Miguel's home is now a landmark home. This home will last another hundred years. We've come a long way and I think we felt paved the way to the long-term solution that the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force recommends. But as Maria said, we must remain vigilant sure that the recommendations are all through. So Maria, we salute the work that you have done on the task force and your fidelity to this issue. When we complete uh, this challenge of saving the Gales home, I am perfectly willing to leave the work of rehabbing homes to your set with its history of helping over 630 older occupied homes to become more habitable. We will be very happy to leave this work to the incredible professions at Merced, people like Jesse Flores over here, uh, and his staff who have done this tremendous job. And I'd like to thank, thank uh, Sue Gibb, who I think is behind the stage here, for her assistance in putting this together. But thanks very much for your attention. Your tenacity is amazing. Thank you. So Sister Jane Ann was telling you about a time when um, we detached from, from Mercy Housing and we were having what we called a work session at our office and uh, for a, a brief time in our tenure, Father Rufus with me was on the board of Merced Housing, Texas. I firmly believe that, you know, in my life, and I bet you think about it in your life, just when you needed the help, or just when you needed the insight, that person is there. So we were sitting around the table in our office, and um, Father Rufus said, uh, can I, can I see your bottles for a minute, your articles? And we got it for him. He said, you know, I was involved in something like this a while back. And he says, I know what you can do. Um, Mercy's the sole member of your corporation. You could ask them to, to exit. And we all went, all right. And then we went, oh my goodness, that was a fabulous idea. And Mercy saw it as a way up for them, and we saw it as a way for us to continue our life. For that, Father Rufus, I'm always very thankful to you. And uh, we've been hearing some local stories here about investment of time and talent and dollars, and Father Rufus is going to talk to us about what investments he's been involved in lately. Just sort of pass them around. 
uh, and it gives you an idea of one of the things I'm going to say at the end, but it's about accountability in terms of impact investing and the type of reports that people are beginning to do. Uh, I should have made more copies, I apologize. There we go. And uh, we don't need this. I will probably go through this very quickly. Um, that's, someone has always told me I should do an outline. I can't tell you whether that outline is going to make any sense when we're finished. But you had an outline. You can tell my uh, teacher from our Lady of Lake University in the construction class that I learned one thing to put up an outline even if you don't follow it. <laughs> the first part is sort of generally a context. One of the things that I was asked to do was to try to situate what is called impact investing within the tradition of theology, Catholic social teaching. And it's almost impossible to do, but I decided to start at least within the U.S. context, was what was written in 1986. It was a pivotal uh, step by the Catholic bishops with their pastoral economic justice for all. The first one they wrote was the famous Peace Pastoral. This one uh, was the second one. And if you take what they said, it's as applicable today as it was in 1986. But they started off the very first paragraph that said, there are three questions when you look at the economy. Put in your own mind instead of economy, finance, or investment, or whatever. And it is, what does the economy, what does investment do for people? What does it do to people? And how do people participate in it? And if you want a good example, if you just think back on what you have heard today, about the way investment has affected housing, what does it do? That question frames a lot of what you've heard today already. I didn't realize it would do that uh, in any way. And certainly the last question, how do people participate? You've heard the story of percent housing, so the way people can participate. You heard the wonderful story of the people who came out to help save Miguel's house. How do people participate? It's an institutional response to individual response. If you move on, they try to specify what those three questions might mean in terms of what they identify as six principles when you look at an economy, when you look at finances, when you look at anything within a social context. Uh, you've got the reference uh, on the paragraph numbers. Again, you'll notice many of them were things that Seamus referred to and uh, Maria uh, referred to in terms of what were the goals of what people should look at. One of the most pivotal statements in that document was in section 354, which was the first time explicitly the church in the United States said we are an economic actor and we are responsible for our economic decisions. Uh, you, can, you can read through it, uh, but again, it was a pivotal time to say, and it, it, it grows out of really bad views understanding of body and staff, the church and the modern world. Subsequent to the pastoral letter, the Catholic Bishops' Conference set up a committee that wrote or were called the Principles of Investment for the United States Catholic Conference, which would, by extension, be the church. Uh, interestingly, we haven't done much beyond 2003, uh, institutionally, in, in terms of writing. But uh, this is still valid. It certainly needs some work. But basically what they said, when we're looking at how we invest our financial resources, our pension funds, our endowment funds, whatever you want. We need to keep three things in mind. In our investments, we should do no evil. Do no harm. We should be active participants with the investments we make. 
And thirdly, we should develop positive strategies to use our finances for the common good. Think back to some of the things you've heard. Positive strategies to promote the common good. Housing is the common good. Do no harm. Avoid investments that lead to gentrification, that destroy communities. Participation. If you have investments in housing companies, find out what their policies are. Engage them. Try to encourage them. Banks. Do they participate in explicit or implicit red line? Anyway, you can see how all of that might touch on the topic we had. In terms of the broader investment perspective, in terms of investments in the public markets, and that's what most people are uh, acquainted with, your 401ks are generally invested in the public markets. Companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange or foreign exchange or government debt, corporate debt, anything that's immediately uh, 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 valuable. Uh, and in terms of how the church and people and institutions respond, it was first to develop screens, which would mean to say, we will not invest in these things, and they passed them on to their investment managers, so it means they were excluded. After that became enhanced and, and really situated, the next step was to move to advocacy, that is, active participation, moving from do no evil to active participation. And the examples of that are the seriously low process. To have active engagement with the people in whom you invest, through shareholder resolutions, dialogue. And that was the period of time where you saw the creation of the Catholic Coalitions of Responsible Investment, one of which was uh, Texas Crime, which became SRIP. And uh, seeing everybody told the story, and it will be at my expense, I was a young, uh, barely ordained, and we, we had what became the first meeting of, uh, of uh, what became Texas Crime with the religious leadership that Mike invited uh, to Christian Renewal Center in uh, Houston, Texas. And we brought down two people to give presentations. One is Mike Crosby, who recently passed away from a really prophetic capture. And then uh, a, a layman who was head of the ICCR at the time. And they gave a presentation, and then we divided it into religious communities to see if we could commit to doing something. And, and here is the story, and I mean this respectfully. I looked over the room, and the, the, the congregations of women religious were having these big heated dialogues. Uh, Mike had already made the decision, which, which was fine for me. Uh, but I looked at one group of women religious, the Carnegie Word Sisters from Houston. And I, the, uh, the Superior General was sort of sitting apart and we weren't discussing. Well, I found out that she ruled with an iron fist. They had already made their decision too. So if things rolled on, it made me tend to respect something about hierarchical order sometimes. <laughs> Makes things more efficient. But, uh, this also led to the uh, uh, creation and the active involvement of uh, groups in the more ecumenical uh, groups, the ICCR, which has now grown to include uh, many civil organizations. But you began to see a movement from screening to active advocacy and involvement. And then there's a third step, which, which I think is just becoming uh, very fruitful. And it's, it's beginning to say proactive investment. Let's use our money to do some good. Uh, and uh, there, there are sort of two ways to talk about it. One of the more historical ways is what's called ESG, environmental, social, and governmental characteristics of the company. And, and basically what we say is an investment manager or, or investors choose companies or products to invest in of companies that have 
very positive ESG criteria, whether it be across the board or in terms of the key ESG criteria for a particular sector. Uh, that's sort of the proactive investment in the public markets. What has really moved and, and become quite an quite a effort is the evolution of proactive investment into the private markets. So the private markets are the investments that you put money in and it's in for a long term. It's private equity in terms of buyouts, venture, life science, technology, infrastructure would be some examples. Uh, I, I always hesitate to use examples of names because the names that you would recognize probably aren't very good at this. But when you see David Rubenstein give a talk, uh, David Rubenstein is the head of Blackstone, which is one of the largest private equity firms in the world. Uh, and I'm sorry, David Rubenstein is Carlisle. Uh, but it's, it, they're big firms like that, but they're also uh, much smaller. And uh, they tended to highlight, oh, okay, would have been good had I uh, known what my slide said. Taking a step back, ESG principles in the private markets would include concern about supply chain issues, environmental issues, labor issues, community issues. It begins to broaden an investment plan in the private market to think about what is the output that is produced. An example in one of the ones I passed around is Eight Miles, which is an Africa focused fund, which is very specific on their ESG goals. And uh, the report, you'll see they go through labor issues, health issues, the impact they're having on the community, and they have a plan for each year uh, that they apply. In a sense, it morphs into impact because it affects the community. But when they first went into it, it was more in terms of ESG. But one of the important issues in all of this is the difference between what is called output and output. Okay. As long as the firm is in control of what's happening, you can control the result. But when they exit, which means they sell it to somebody else and there's new owners or it's merged into something else, it becomes an issue of output. How do you guarantee that what you've done in the short term continues into the long term? But moving beyond the ESG is the development into impact investing. And a lot of it has to do with the uh, su uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations. In other words, it's become sort of the linchpin of the impact investing community. And by that I mean, if you're going to call yourself a fund that's doing impact investing, you have to almost measure yourself against these 17 goals. Not necessarily reach each one of them, but that has to be the focus and target of your investments. Projects, investments that will advance the elimination of poverty, the elimination of hunger, going through all 17. And you've probably seen the goals more like that. That's sort of the big matrix of the uh, sustainable development goals. And when you look at some of the reports I've passed around, you'll see that the specific investments, they'll have the actual sustainable development goals, that picture beside it, which is the target or the outcome. When you talk about impact investing, to attain those goals within the private market, most people make a distinction between concessional and market rate of return. Okay, concessional investment means you expect a return, it's not philanthropy, but you're willing to accept less of a return financially in terms of what you would expect from a similar investment in order to attain the impact goal. And in a sense, it's saying the impact goal is important enough for me 
that I'm willing to sacrifice part of the financial return. Uh, now remember, for religious groups, the money that's being invested in this way is generally used in terms of the returns to advance a social goal. So you're balancing a lot of things for uh, uh, endowments for education or whatever. So it, it is somewhat of a, a balance. Category two is where you go into it and the project is going to achieve sustainable development goals, but it's also going to give you what's considered a market rate of return. Uh, and, and that's where a lot of emphasis is today. The trade-off generally, very honestly, is there's a higher risk profile than in more traditional investments. So a lot of things sort of squish between the two. You know, nobody goes out and uh, really loudly says I'm a concessional investor. Uh, but anyway, uh, you, you need to think about it in terms of that. Uh, I was asked to give some examples. And uh, I, I say these carefully. Almost all of them up there I had personal knowledge of or I would not have put them up. But I also want to say very emphatically, uh, which is in one of the disclosures, I'm not recommending them. Uh, I'm not giving you any investment advice. Uh, uh, anyway. One is shared interest, which is definitely a concessional investment. Uh, the, the organizer is Donna Katz, I think I got it right this time, Shane, which uh, uh, basically focuses on women's uh, empowerment through uh, economic development, uh, small projects in sub-Saharan Africa. It's been around for a long time. It was one of the ways of responding to the elimination of change in South Africa. Uh, Michael West is a, uh, based in Silver Spring, Maryland, and is a, uh, a fund that basically funds microfinance institutions throughout the world. Uh, their footprint is, uh, is, is just amazing. They also were listed in IA50, which is sort of the go-to list of impact investment groups uh, that have been successful and, and have a good track record. And they do both concessional and impact investments. But if you go to look at that list, and the website is there, uh, it, if a, if a group is listed there, it, it has a good track record. Interestingly, the Pontifical Mission Society, through one of their subsidiaries, Missio Invest, is launching a concessional investment project that would see, in the, especially in Africa, church-owned lands so that they could become profitable in terms of uh, crop production, both for the local communities, but also that the income that is generated would support the local church in Africa. If it's successful, it, it'll be uh, quite a step. In terms of market rate of returns, some examples are, uh, if you're looking at a fund of funds, and that means you give the money to an investment manager who is qualified by the SEC and is regulated and all the other stuff. And they pool the money together in a lot of groups then turn around and invest it for you. Uh, Ascension Asset Management, which is based in St. Louis, grows out of the Dollars of Charity, uh, has completed two impact funds, each one of about $50 million, and is raising money for the third. Uh, Morgan Stanley just started a Climate Impact Solutions Fund, which was, uh, when we were talking about advocacy, is, is the outgrowth of the work of the Dominican Sisters and their interest in climate solutions. Uh, they worked three or four years, and finally work, uh, Morgan Stanley came up with something, and uh, it, it obviously responds to the Lodazio C and uh, this sustainable development goal number seven. Newberger Berman, which is one of the largest uh, 
investment firms in the world, uh, has just developed their first impact fund, which focuses on all the SDGs. And interestingly, this one I got, the ones above I know something about, uh, I, I just want the one copy of what I found interesting is KKR. If you read uh, Barbarian and, and the, uh, Gates, uh, that's the foundation of KKR. Later decided to do a global impact fund, uh, which to me was just amazing. Uh, I don't know anything about it, but they've gotten a lot of good press on it. Uh, but it, it shows you that the idea of impact investing um, is beginning to move into the larger firms. There are also direct funds, which, which means they do one thing, you're, you're in it, and one of them I passed around is Silverlands 2, which is an opportunistic agricultural fund in, uh, in uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, their booklet is this thing, uh, their impact investment report each year. Uh, LOR, which is also mentioned in the IA50, is a venture fund that focuses on microfinance and education uh, in India and Latin America. Interestingly, in Mexico, they have made investments in some financial institutions that work with people to be able to uh, make the down payments on affordable housing. And Inspire Evolution is an African Resource Efficiency Fund. And WRB Sarah is a clean energy fund focused on Caribbean and Latin America. So that's it. It's just to give you an idea of, of what's out there. The, <coughs> something's on there, it doesn't mean anything real significantly. It's not on there, it doesn't mean anything real significant. It's just to give you an idea of the flavor. Finishing up very, very quickly some of the theoretical uh, issues. In terms of the public markets in moving to the proactive type of investments and even in the private markets, I think it's important to begin to merge two things. You've got to still continue to do no we apply the screen. So you eliminate certain things from the investment universe and then ask yourself hey, which are the best in terms of proactive investments. Secondly, to be aware of very much the issue between output and outcomes. And to look at, especially in the private markets, when people exit, how do they guarantee or set in place structures that the good output that they accomplish will be continued by the successors. And you can think of impact investment in three stages. Philanthropic grants are very important. It's a gift. Many times, firms that do impact investment start out of a philanthropic grant that gives them the initial seed capital and management money. Uh, they then many times will move to concessional products and then finally true market rate returns. And one of the things I think we've got to begin to think about are what, what I call quasi-impact investments. And to begin the dialogue with people that are in the private markets to look at what they're doing and see if they can expand the impact focus. So it may be a blended type of thing. Where I think of that is some of the infrastructure funds, road building, access, certainly the rural areas to markets is important. Infrastructure fund might do some of that and also something that would be more traditional. Life science funds, uh, investment in products that will address diseases in the developing world where there's not a much of a profit motive with other investments. I, I think we're going to see more of that. Anyway. Quick caveats. Uh, and, and just to get you thinking, is it possible to be Catholic with just screening using the USCC criteria, which came out in November of 2003? One of my hangups, so I'll be honest. Uh, if you look at it, it's uh, he's laughing. It's dated back 2003. There's a lot that's happened in the world since 2003. One of them being climate change becoming a real issue. You read the uh, November 2003 USCC guidelines, you won't see a lot about climate change. 
So it's just a way of saying, as a church, people in leadership probably need to suggest to the bishops, it's time to look at that again. Uh, with the right people. Uh, is it possible for a product to be ESG sensitive and not Catholic? Okay, I don't think the two are coexistent. Uh, and the third question, are all impact efforts necessarily Catholic? It, it's trying to say that we have some specific, and I'd say for the faith community in general, we have some specific concerns that may not just be covered by ESG principles or impact. Uh, and just to say for those of you who, who have been involved in private market uh, investments, many times you'll run into people that say, well, you take it or leave it. That's not true anymore. It's very possible through the use of side letters to get yourself excluded from investments that, that you would find uh, Unacceptable. Uh, and then I just, if there's a, I, I've used the U.S. context and U.S. letters, but if, if you look at any of the broader statements of the recent posts, and even many of the ecumenical statements of many of the groups, all of them, or most of them, will end up saying something like the purpose of the economy or the market or finances is to serve the common good human advancement. And I think one of the newest things that's been, been, been seen, and, and Maria mentioned it, the gentrification is certainly an example of it, is the generational issue. What are we leaving? Uh, I can't say for my kids. I can say for some of you, for your kids. Uh, and it, it sort of gets down to, it is not the purpose of humanity to serve the maximization of profit in the short term but rather the purpose of the economy, of the market, is to serve humanity. And you see that playing out in a lot of things. The war of exercise in 1981, which defined the role of the economy in terms of human dignity and work. So a lot of human beings' self-esteem comes up with respect for their work. A lot of see is very uh, evident today but you've got a whole series. Practically any time a pope writes about anything, you, you end up getting the, the common thing there. And basically what they're developing is to say there's not anything that's particularly perfect or not perfect. There's a set of values. And you have to critique any economic system or market system against those set of values. And, and you see the critique of socialism is that it basically does away with respect for the individual. And the critique of capitalism is that it runs the risk of not respecting the common good. You can see some of that in the housing issues that we've talked about today. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah. Those are the disclosures I have to give. Uh, thank you, and I hope I've stayed fairly close to
And if I didn't mention your name, we still thank you for anything you may have done to make this event happen. Sister Veronica, do you want to say anything to conclude? Okay. With that, go in peace. Thank you.